We're going to talk about roots growing deeper with the Lord. A lot of times churches uh, draw back from growing deeper because it's very easy and it's very casual and it's uh, you know very little risk when you can have a casual relationship with God, something that's on the surface. You start to dig deeper and sometimes the Word of God, as we're going to learn today, we're going to talk about seeds and the power of a seed. We're going to talk about the four different types of soil, and we're really going to concentrate on two types today and probably two types next Sunday. Because when you start to dig deeper with God, and it is something that is necessary for the body of Christ, the body of Christ has to go deeper because the answer that we keep, the questions that we keep getting over and over again is Pastor, why is our lives so similar to the world's lives? Why are we dealing with some of the same things inside the church that should be taken care of by the power of the gospel? Why are we still dealing with those things in our lives? It's because we have drawn away from the intimate relationships with God and we've moved more towards the casual relationships. I don't know how many of you saw yesterday on MSN, but one of the largest charismatic Pentecostal denominations in the world gave a long article that said that the people inside of that denomination are drawing away from their spiritual roots or foundation because it's not acceptable any longer to the open public. So to gather more people that will come and assemble together, they have decided that it is in the best interest of the body for them not to express the freedoms of certain types of worship. And I'm not here to, be, to, to throw stones at other people and other places and other churches that do it different than we do it. Because that, that's not my, my job and it's not encouraging to the body and it does no good to, com- to do those type of things. But I want you to understand completely. That elevation is here and the spiritual DNA of elevation is for us to find the freedom of God and to experience the presence of God in such a way that it changes our lives. We are not here, I will repeat, we are not here to build a crowd. I can build a crowd through entertainment. But when the music stops and when the guy that can come better than I am that will be able to speak more eloquently than I can and your problems still persist, you don't need any more music, and you don't need any more sermons. You need an encounter with God that changes your life and does something that I cannot do. So that is the purpose of this Root series. And we're going to start in Matthew chapter 13 with a parable about a story about a farmer and his ability to sow seed. And we're going to begin with verse 1 in Matthew chapter 13. And the Bible reads, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and a great crowd gathered around Him, so that He got into the boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And He said said to them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. And other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up. And since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. 
And other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on the, gr- on the soil, on good soil, and produced grain, some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirty. He that has ears, let him hear. Now, if you've got your Bibles open, look down at verse 18, because Jesus now is going to explain the parable that, that he just spoke. And the Bible again reads, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what is sown along the path. As for that that was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and proves and it proves unfruitful. As for the one that was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundred, another sixty, and another thirty. Let's pray once more. Father, I ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to touch our lives in such a way that again, that we are ready to receive your word, and I give you the praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes you live through experiences for a purpose. Now, sometimes God doesn't cause things to happen, but you live through those things and able to to garner some relationships. And let's, let's give this thing a test. How many of you have learned something the hard way and you've never forgot it? Say amen. 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 Pretty much everybody. See, Jesus tells a story about a a farmer that has seed, and we understand through the interpretation in just a moment, I'm going to reiterate this, they don't have to skip in the outline, is that that seed is the Word of God. And and the, the soil is the people or the hearts of people and the different types of hearts that receive that soil, that, that seed. So I want to get it clear that there's nothing wrong with the seed. And the different types of soil all produce something. They produce results. Sometimes the results aren't what we want. But all four soils produce results. But I want to step back because I lived in North Florida for about seven and a half years. And in that region where I lived, it was the primary, one of the primary income sources of that region was farming. And a farmer, one, you have to understand that the seed that they are sowing is the harvest of yesterday. If they grew corn, they got enough corn, they took the corn off of the cob, and they saved some of those kernels of corn to the next year use for seed to reproduce another harvest. I know you thought that they come in the packs, But somebody has to go get those seeds and put them in the packs and put the pretty picture on top of them. And the only way that those seeds are produced is through the plant and which is on the front of that that cover. And so you have to understand that there isn't a problem with the seed. And a farmer isn't about gaining more seed. He's about gaining a harvest. Because he don't get paid for seed. He gets paid for the harvest. And so the farmer's job is to do everything he can in preparation to get to a place where there is a harvest in our lot, in in, in his field. According to the parable, Jesus didn't come just so you could go to heaven. According to our story, Jesus came that he might plant seed in your life that reproduces a harvest, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. That means that everyone under the capacity of the hearing of this message has, a, has a, a job, has a destiny. More than just you getting out of the position of needing uh, Jesus to save you from hell. That's, uh, heaven's icing on the cake. If it was all about heaven, you'd say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and you would die and go to heaven. But it's not about that. It's about him taking you then as the seed and planting you into the ground because he being the living word is now living in us and we become the outsource of that living word in us that we might touch the lives of other people. And so there's in this story, it's all about can we reap a harvest? Because if it was just in the, in the parable, then we could understand, well, it's more about preparing your heart. It's more about getting the rocks out. And there's a point to that. 
It's more about making sure you get to the place where you're good ground. And there's a point to that. But even in the explanation of the story, he says the ultimate job is to get you to a place where some are reaping 30-fold, some are 40-fold, some are 100-fold, or 30, 40, 30, 60, and 100. So it's multiplication. It's not about how if you're going to heaven as much as how many people are you on this earth to touch that they can go to heaven too. So we get to this point where, where the Bible, Jesus is sitting in front of these people. There's a large crowd that has gathered. He's jumped on a boat, backed out into the water for just a little bit, and he's starting to teach. And the first thing he says is there's a farmer, there's a, there's a sower or a farmer that has seed, and he goes about and he's going to sow into the ground. And he goes along and he starts to throw this seed onto the ground and the seed finds itself falling on different types of soil. And we know that one, according to Scripture, according to the interpretation in in, in Mark um, chapter 4 verse 14 that tells the story, the Bible says the sower sows the word, or it's the word of the kingdom. It's the message of Jesus. It's the gospel. And he's sowing it and it's going to find its way into four types of soil. The the wayside or the path, stony ground, thorny ground, or good ground. And the first group of of seed falls on what the, the story calls the path or the wayside. First, let's talk about the soil described in this path or this wayside. It is the ground that surrounds the plowed field. So I want you to get in your mind, and, and I'm going to use this section as, as a kind of a, an illustration. This section is in rows, and it's turned over plowed ground. The wayside would be the outskirts or the aisles of this room. This would be the wayside or the path, and this would be the wayside or the path, and this would be the wayside or the path. What makes it the wayside isn't the quality of the soil. The soil is exactly the same quality as this soil right here, but it cannot produce because it has not been disturbed. They use it to drive the tractors on. We're going to get out of the Bible for a moment, get into the 21st century. In the Bible, they walked around the field. That's where the animals walked around the field. But today, that's where the John Deere's drive around the field. And when they drive around the field in in preparation for tilling that soil and plowing that soil, it packs the soil down where it becomes hard. I want you to remember, it's the same soil that's in the pews. It's the same soil that's in the aisle. The only difference is, this has been disturbed, this has not. This has been walked on, trampled on, hardened, packed, and it cannot receive the seed. Now here's where I have to preach a little bit, buckle up. If you want the gospel, and I'm going to preach different today, because I'm a loving guy. I'm, I'm gracious, I want everybody to go to heaven, I want all dogs to go to heaven. You know, I heard about that. I heard that they all go to heaven. I think they made a movie about that one time. But irregardless, in my heart, it is full of grace. But sometimes we've offended the word by preaching grace, grace, grace without responsibility. Is God full of grace? Yes, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. But that doesn't leave you without responsibility. See, if you think that you're going to come into connection with the gospel and it's not going to disturb your life, you are wrong. You can just you put it in your mind. It's going to mess everything that I know up. But at the end, because that's what that, that plow was for, to disturb the ground. It was to take that hard ground and break it up. It was to take it and prepare it for the seed. It's to dig down deep and turn it over and get all the nutrients flowing. And yes, it's more comfortable to stay undisturbed. But when the Word of God comes into your life and the gospel comes into your life, it starts to disturb the things that are the status quo. and And the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and said, let's plow this area up. And you go, I don't like plowing. It hurts. It bothers me. It's difficult. I've got to make decisions that are right instead of wrong. I want to live for me. That's all of our nature. That's the human nature. I want to live for me. And Jesus says, I want you to live for me. Because the Bible says that 
the difference between the good ground and the wayside is just simply it's packed down and cannot receive the seed. And, the, and it's a, a piece of, of ground that has not been plowed. And so when the farmer throws the seed, it can only lay on the surface. And that in the Bible says in, in, in the story that birds fly in and pick up the seeds. And then when he explains it, he says this. It's the reason that the birds come in, and he even gets a little more detailed. He said the evil one will come in because they receive the word of God, but they're hardened to the word of God because they don't understand the word of God. And that's a, a great message for discipleship that you just can't hear the word. It's not enough to be close. That, gra- that wayside's as close as you can get to good ground. But why? why? So close is not enough. Only thing that happens with close is hand grenades and, and horseshoes. If you're within that horseshoe, you get a point. But in life, it doesn't happen that way. Man, I can preach right there for a little bit. My wife don't like me to preach that way because, you know, there's some good stuff in movies. I won't mention the movie because it's not the best movie that my wife enjoys me watching. But if you're second, you're last. Anybody know that movie? You're second, you're last. Because when, when sometimes we just feel, if we just get close to God. No, it's not enough to get close to God. Because when you get close to God, He's going to want to plow. When you get close to God, He's going to want to disrupt some stuff. He's going to want to dig down and break up some ground and, and get things disoriented a little bit so He can bring order to your life. Because left to yourself, the Bible says, is a bad path for you to take because you yourself are motivated by the, by the natural need to live for self instead of for others so you never can fulfill the natural potential. That's why, and I'm going to get a little nosy today and a little, that's why some of your previous relationships didn't didn't work out is because you were living for you and your spouse couldn't fit in because you were living for you but it's when the word of God comes and wants to break that stuff up and that's why when I read this parable today or this week and I was studying it really brought me to an understanding they don't understand the gospel let me get old school for a minute I don't want to forget my iPad. Let me get old school. This is the Bible. Let me get one in my hand. See, a lot of people believe that the Bible is only a book of rules to rob you of your fun. And rob you of of life's joys. They don't understand, and that's why they're hardened to it. Because all they see is the crazy people on TV that call themselves Christians that do crazy things that aren't necessarily a representation of Christ. And so they look at this book and they say, well, wait a minute, that's that book of rules that God forces us to love Him. If we don't love Him, He sends us to hell. I don't want a a relationship with a God like that. That's an an ignorant view, and I I say that not derogatory. It's an unlearned view of the gospel. Because if you understand that a few of those rules are not rules for your hindrance to fun, but they're guardrails, look at what, if you look back in hindsight's 2020 and you look back at some of the most hurtful, painful results of your life, and then you find the gospel and find out if I would have lived my life according to this, I wouldn't have had to go through some of that. Because God set me up. To do things the right way, not for my lack of enjoyment, but to give me the freedom of living the destiny that He created me to be. And I had to go through the plowing to get to the place where He could put the seed in and I could be... How many of you went through plowing? Say amen. How many of you are different than what you were when you first met Christ? It wasn't easy, was it? I, and most of the time, I'm very transparent. That scares my mom, dad, and my wife. In my moments of rebellion, and when I left the faith, when I walked away from what I knew to be right, I developed habits. And I've been up front. I enjoyed doing drugs. I enjoyed drinking. And I made a habit 
of my speech being very, very bad. So I used words that were not appropriate. I get my life, I have my prodigal son moment, I want to come to a relationship and encounter that relationship with God once again that moves me back into the house and not outside. And I'm out there in, in Panama City Beach, a mess. Everything that I own is in the back seat of my car. My parents have had to ask me to leave the home. I'm, I'm getting up. I'm controlled by the things that I, enjoy, that I say that I enjoy doing. I'm doing them with about 100 people and feel absolutely alone every day. And I reach up to heaven and I say, God, I want to live as much for you as I've tried to live for me. I know what's right. I know how to get in relationship with you. And I'm ready for this thing. And he said, okay, let's get to plowing. Okay, don't do drugs. But I like, you want to be good soil? We got to dig down and get that out. Because you're not doing them because they feel good. You're doing them because they're covering up a hurt that's inside that you feel this way and you need to know that I'm more than that and I'm free. You don't have to go back to a dealer. You don't have to go back and find something. You don't have to go to another bottle. You don't have to uncork another lid. I can be that for you. But it's going to take you changing the atmosphere in which you're in. Let's plow a while. And I had to do those things. And the hardest thing, to be honest with you, the, the hardest thing for me to get through was not drugs and alcohol. The hardest thing for me to get through was my language. Because I talked bad. I used words that my mom and dad never have used in their life. And I, I remember my first church I went to pastor. I'm not saying I'm over it yet. <laughs> I'm better at it. But there I am, I'm working in, uh, and we're remodeling the sanctuary, and I'm under this little thing. And I raise up, and I crack my skull. And that word comes into my head that I want to say to that thing that run it, had the audacity to run itself into my head. <laughs> and I remember the Holy Spirit at that moment saying, you don't talk that way anymore. And I just thought it. And the next time I walked by that shelf, I said, I cussed you out in my head. <laughs> but I didn't say it out loud. The point is, is that all of us have plowing that needs to take place in our lives. And the Word of God will penetrate and break up the, the hard ground of our lives to produce good ground, if we allow it. The second seed was on rocky soil. This is ground that looks good. On the surface, but underneath the surface there's rocks that prevent the root from growing deep. According to Matthew 13, 5 and 6, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up. And since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they, scorched, they were scorched and since they had no root, they withered away. And then the explanation is in 20 and 21. It says, as for those that were sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures for a while when tribulation or persecution arises. On account of the word, immediately they fall away. These are hearts that are received the gospel with joy. And immediately that joy of meeting and fellowshipping with Christ becomes overwhelming. And they want to win the world for Jesus. And they want to put hell out with a water pistol. And immediately a green shoot out of the ground comes up of their faith. And they're so excited about God and so excited. But then God starts to get nosy and starts to get you know kind of bossy. And, and the relationships he wants is not always on the surface. Because that's the whole analysis. It's a surface relationship with a rock underneath that won't allow the roots to dig down. And so what they do is they spend most of their life frustrated coming back and forth in their faith because they shake their fist at the sun. Because in the story you think the sun's the bad guy. It's the truth. Because remember, it didn't have much soil to, to dig into, so the sun come up and scorched it. Do you realize that the sun is necessary for every plant to grow? If there is no sun, there is no harvest, there is no fruit, there is no plant, there is no crop. The sun's not the bad guy. The bad guy is the rock underneath the surface that's presenting the, preventing the root from growing deeper. 
I think the rock is us. Because the moment that you have to give up, you know that the, the gospel is controversial. Did you know that? That it almost goes to war with you immediately. That you've always wanted your will, and now it's saying, now live my will. And, and it wants to get past that rock of self. And it has to grow deep, and the sun comes up, and you say, well, pastor, what, what happens? Give me a little more explanation. If you think that you might be rocky soil, listen to this. If you tell God that you're angry with Him because He didn't answer a prayer the way that you wanted Him to, then you may have a surface relationship. I've counseled with people said, I, ain't, I used to be saved. I'm not anymore. My grandmother died. And I prayed for God to heal her. And I want to say, do you know how crazy that sounds? Your grandmother is in perfect health in the presence of God in heaven with Jesus. And you're going to hell. But you're showing God. Because the Bible says that when we have faith that is shallow, the moment that tribulation comes. You ever met anybody that, met, that had an encounter with Christ in a, in a service and they come to the altar and they give everything to Him, but they keep wanting to live their life the way that they, kept, they were living before that and, and don't, won't, won't let the Word penetrate and plow up the ground and change some things. And so they're, they're good for a while. And then the Bible literally in the original language says they become offended by the Word. God says, okay, I've had enough. It's me and you. That goes or I go. But I like that. Well, the sun's coming up. Because you can't handle tribulation and trial and conflict when you have a surface relationship with Jesus. You're either in or you're out. It's like swimming. You can't swim and not get wet. You can wade. You can wade and go up into your ankles and walk around and call that swimming. That ain't swimming. That's walking in shallow water. See, you're still in control. When you jump in over your head, see, I got the chance to go to the Bahamas this week. I loved it. Four days. We got there, and there, wasn't, there were like hundreds of people on the beach, and these waves were like eight feet tall, and nobody was out there in the water. I told you about me and my brother. Sometimes we don't have the best sense in the world. Like saying, hey, there must be a reason there isn't anybody in the water. No, me and him look at each other and say, hey, let's go play in the eight-foot waves. We don't have a surfboard, let's body surf. I have to admit, he went first. <laughs> he looked out there and got time, that thing, and it went slack for a minute. He jumped in, next thing you know, he's out there having fun. I said, hey, man, I want to do that too. So I waited, poof. Next thing you know, there's people. Beep, 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 beep. We're like, they're going, you're going to drown. There's a rip current. It's dangerous. That's the word of God. See, I found out, I was only out there for like 15 seconds, and I found out that I was really small. I was really big when I was on the beach. But when you put really big people into a really big ocean, you find out that the really big person ain't really as big as the ocean, and you find out that the ocean can take you anywhere that it wants to. And that's the Word of God. That's the sun that comes up without the depth when life doesn't go the way you want it to and God seems to be a million miles away. If your relationship is simply built upon what you feel, you will go away from the faith. But there's so much more to this gospel than what you feel. That when you can sing, when your mom is going into a heart catheterization and you've talked to the lady and the nurse has said, if it was my 80-year-old mom, I would be here because I don't know she's going to make it. Then you can get up there and still sing 
sing the praises of an almighty God because you know whether she does or doesn't, it really doesn't matter in the long run because she's in the, in the hand of God when it comes down to it. Will she feel bad? Yes. Is there moments of confusion and anxiety? Yes. Has there been tears that have fallen? Yes. But at the end, you've got to really believe what you say you believe because if you don't, you will crumble under the crisis of the moment. Do you believe there is a heaven? Do you believe that there is a Jesus that died on the cross? Because, and ultimately, when somebody looks you in the eye and gives you a scenario that is bigger than you are, you either have to believe what you said you've believed by word and now take it to faith. And the only way that's possible is to get the you out of the way and let the root go down and say, God, I have never seen heaven. I have never once laid my eyes upon who you were walking on this earth. But I know that you are who you said you are. Because I know 12 guys that 10 of them died a martyr's death because they saw you get up from the grave. And there have been thousands of years of truth. And your word is still as real today as it's ever been. So I have to believe that there's a heaven up there that I've never laid my eyes on. No matter what the doctors might present to me in my health condition. You ever notice, Amy, if you'll get ready to play me something. You ever notice that how easy it is? To believe a miracle for somebody else. But when it's you, sometimes we can get a little squirrely. You're like, oh my God, I'm going to die. All right? That's a possibility. I might die tomorrow too. So what are we going to do? I'm definitely not going to lay down and let it have me. I'm fighting my way all the way. (laughs) Do we just sing songs or do we, you know, I was thinking about that. Man, I couldn't have coordinated this any better for this sermon. You know, Stephanie, she's already got a beautiful voice. And she is up there singing about when my, when my strength is fading and my time has come. I remember telling my dad. We were out on a boat. I can still remember the day. We were out on a boat out in the middle of the ocean in Panama City, which I still think is some of the beautiful, most beautiful water in the world. And some happened where we talked about what would happen when we were dying. And I said, Dad, I don't want people around my bed, me having to kiss everybody, you know, tell them I wanted to kiss them while I was alive and healthy. By the time I got to that point, I, I, you know, I hope I've loved as much as I could love. I said, you know what, I, what would be my dream? If the Lord should tarry long enough for me to go by the grave. Dave, if you can come. Oh, there. Amy's getting ready. Listen to this. I said, this is what I want to say as my last words. See, I really believe this thing. I really believe the gospel. I would want my family to gather near and say, Dad's talking. What's he saying? Is he telling mom he loves her? No, he already told her he loved her for all the years they've been married. He has told her every single day how much he loves her. Is he telling us, his sons, how much? Or his daughter-in-laws how much? No, he's told them every day too. How about grandkids? I've already got like 20. And I haven't even gotten any from David and Josh yet. You know, what if Benjamin runs up there and says, what's, what's Hoppy saying? Is he saying something? Is he giving me gum? No, his gum time's over. No, I want them to get close enough and hear these words. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come. Let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angels of the Lord encamp round about those that fear Him and deliver them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that takes refuge in Him. That's what I want. Because on that day when the sun is scorching, I don't want there to be the rock of me underneath the surface that wants to wait a minute and cry about why I'm dying so young. 
I want to be able to say, hey, I have lived my life to the fullest of the destiny in which God has put me in. And I have done it with all of my heart and all of my strength. And I have been a man that has failed many times, but the Lord has been faithful to pick me up. His word has disturbed my life since the time that it has crossed my path. But every time I let it tear the soil of my heart up, it produced a harvest. Some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. My joy has been fulfilled and I've lacked in nothing. That's the power of the seed. Stand to your feet.